Well, hi there, and welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Real Estate Investing. I'm your host, Sharon Bornholt, and I'm so happy you're tuning in today. My guest today is Chris Craddock, and we are going to do a deep dive into how real estate investors can make money from dead leads. And I love this topic. And we're also going to talk about the investor agent relationship, which is another thing I love to talk about. Chris is a realtor. He's an entrepreneur who runs multiple successful businesses. And he's also the host of the Uncommon Real Estate Podcast, which is how I met him. So welcome to the show, Chris. Hey, yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Well, you know, I'm impressed. I was reading your information and it says your company is closing 30 to 65 deals a month. That's a lot of deals. Yeah. And the fun thing is that's a, I guess that's an old bio because now we're at uh, 60 to 85 a month. So we've, uh, we've grown over the last Whoa. 12, uh, I guess it's been about 18 months since that bio has been updated. So yeah. Wow. That's a lot of deals. So tell me a little bit about your backstory and why real estate? How did you end up in this crazy world of real estate? Yeah. So, you know, I graduated college in 2000 and um, my wife got pregnant in 2003. I was, I was working for a ministry, a, a, a organization called Young Life. And, you know, my life was changed through Young Life. I loved it. It was incredible, but I was making, started out at 20,000. And like when I moved on from Young Life, I was making 25,000 a year. And, uh, you know, when my wife got pregnant and you're making whatever it was, like 20 something thousand dollars a year, it's hard to survive on that in the DC area. Yeah. So, so I went to the library and checked out every book I could on investing. I read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And then I just started following every other book I could find on investing that they had at the local library. Um, cause I couldn't afford to buy books. And I, uh, <laughs> um, and it was before Google was, uh, you know, what it is today. And so, almost like an idiot. I just read it and I did exactly what they told me to do without like thinking too hard about it. And, uh, I just went out and knocked on doors of distressed properties and it was crazy. In the next four months, I made 12 times what I made in a year. And I was like, dang, this is really sweet. And so it allowed me, um, some breathing room where I continued to do ministry for, for a while and, uh, for a long time. And I mean, now I still volunteer and kind of do a lot of stuff with the church just don't get, I'm not a professional Christian anymore. I don't get paid to, to do it. <laughs> professional but, uh, Christian. I love that. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, but then, you know, over time, like uh, the money started running out. And so I ended up doing all these crazy side jobs and crazy things just to keep food on the table. 2010, I was trying to sell my blood for $300 to buy Christmas presents for my family. And then uh, I guess right after that, I was able, I, I was like, okay, that's it. I, I need to make money again. And so I started flipping houses again. And at that point in time, uh, almost everything that I had gone after became short sales. And so um, I found out that you could flip short sales and make a, a massive margin, at least at that time. It's changed since. But uh, and the banks were paying a commission. So I'm like, well, I'll go get a real estate license just so I can get paid my commissions on the short sales I buy to, to flip. And then the banks changed their uh, algorithms and you started making less money on short sales. I couldn't flip them anymore. And, uh, you know, I just started selling them on the market as listings. And that was kind of the genesis of our team. And then I guess December, 2014, we opened our retail team. And since then, you know, we have, you know, a agent business, a title business, a construction business, an insurance business, a flipping business, a wholesaling business, a uh, rental property business. I, I've got 13 different streams of income all in the wow. real estate industry. 13. That's a lot. Boy, this is something we need to dive into more too. So when it comes to dead leads, the common consensus was that um, you'll make about 80% of your deals traditionally through uh, working old leads, but you've kind of put that whole process on steroids. This was a, a statistic from, from an investor point of view about follow-up and the importance of follow-up, but you've taken that to a whole new level. So let's talk about that. Yeah. So, I mean, just think about the, so I've had people give me pushback and said, oh no, the majority of my leads that, that I get there, um, they do want to sell like as a, a cash deal, but I mean, mm -hmm. I, I call bogus on it. I just call yeah. bogus. I don't know where, where they come from, but if you, what I found is if 20 people raise their hand and for me, a motivated seller is somebody that is planning to sell that they're going to sell within the next mm -hmm. six months. And if you get 20 people that raise their hand and say, I'm going to sell within the next six months, 
16 or 16 of them are wanting retail value. And then of the four that want under that want, like will sell at a reduced price, you're probably going to lock up only one of the four and some other investor that's going to pay more than you will, will get the other three. So 19 people are getting paid on those 20 people that are not you. So why not get paid once for the deal that you lock up and find a way to get paid the other 19 times on the deals that, you know, are just higher than you're willing to pay for. That is so, that is so smart because your, uh, your numbers there are exactly what I found out of 20, you may, might set four appointments and get one on average. Maybe if you got really lucky, you might get two, but you would get outbid by another investor that would, if you were the first guy in and you offered whatever you offered, well, let me just give you a little bit more, but it was this very tiresome game. It's just a tiresome game in my book. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And that, and that's, see that uh, to my, in my opinion, I think the best salespeople. So here's, here's one of the things that I've learned is the people that make the most money tend to be the ones that can solve the most people's problem. Right. And mm -hmm. so if you've only got one tool in your tool belt, you have less opportunities to solve problems. Right. And so if somebody wants, uh, and I think this is what's coming in this world is this convergence of the agent investor. And also there's five States that now have, uh, have said you have to have a real estate license to wholesale. So yep. I mean, this is this is the future of real estate is the agent investor kind of coming together. And mm -hmm. if, if you don't see it, you're going to get caught at some point. Um, you know, where you're going to have to run out and get a real estate license or get somebody licensed or get a partner that's licensed or something like that, and you're going to have to figure it out. But this is what's coming. Yes. So investors and agents have traditionally had a kind of a love-hate relationship. And I think it's, I mean, they know they need each other. Well, actually, agents don't know they need investors. Now, investors sometimes start, they, they see the value in having agents in their world on their team as part of their team. And I always, coming from a background, I had a home inspection company for 17 years and agents were the lifeblood of my business. So I got very good at working with agents and helping them solve their problems, which was having an invest, an inspector come in and muck up their deal. So there's a way to tell someone your, your roof needs to be replacing, replaced. But the investor agent relationship, I think they just don't understand each other. They don't understand how they can partner and, and feed, feed each other, so to speak. Right. Right. And see, let me give an example of how powerful this is, because across the country, everybody talks about it and everybody's like, oh, yeah, this is a great, great idea. I'm just going to I'll send it. I'll find a realtor and send it out. And then nothing mm -hmm. comes of it. You make no money. You get no referrals, like no deals actually go mm -hmm. through. And then like, ah, not worth my time. And that's actually what happened with the company that um, that we built this program out with. You know, I I called I called them and I kept saying, hey. Uh, you know, send me some of your dead leads. And, you know, we, I, I, I built a relationship with them and they kept saying, ah, we've, we've tried this with other top agents. We tried this with other people. We've gotten no, like we get no money from it. It's not worth our time. We've tried all that. It's not worth our time. And I was like, well, what's, what have you tried most recently? They're like, we gave one of the top agents in the whole region, a thousand leads over the last six months. And she's closed six deals. So we got referral fees on six deals, which is, is a little bit of money, but it's just not worth our time considering what we're working on here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm like, man, a thousand out of six. So I'm like, well, just give me, give me some, let me, let me prove it. And I kept calling and calling. And what I found in life is persistence breaks resistance. <laughs> and so uh, I just didn't, I didn't stop. And, and they liked me. So they didn't want to tell me to like screw off, but uh, um, eventually they <laughs> were like, okay, We'll give you a, we'll give you 150. So they sent me 150 leads. It turns out 70 of them were already sold. 30 of them were out of area. So like literally of the, of what I had left, whatever it was like 30 or 40 leads I had left. I was like, okay, well now I've got to figure out a way if, if this other girl got out of a thousand, got six, I got to get six out of what I have right now. Mm -hmm. And so I turned on like the best sales hat I've ever turned on. I mean, I went all in to figure it out. And uh, somehow I, I closed six, you know, and I called them up and I was like, hey, um, you know, I got six listing agreements signed. So, you know, give me the, your W-9. I'll send over the, uh, the referral fees and, you know, you'll make some money. And they're like, you got six signed? Uh, and then, <laughs> it's so funny. He called it. He's like, he was like, listen. He's like, we liked you. You're a nice guy. We didn't want to tell you to just stop bugging us. 
uh, and leave us alone. So like I just said to Matt, I was like, hey, send over uh, send over 100 or 150 leads that are five years old. And, uh, you know, just so that you'll hit a, a brick wall and leave us alone and stop calling us. And, <laughs> and he's like, but you got as many signed as this other girl. And so so they're like, why don't you come into the office? So I came into the office. We sat down. We came up with a game plan to build it out. And actually this month, this next month, um, let's see, we're you know, three days away from the next month. This next month, my retail team is going to send them $81,000 in referral fees. 81000 wow. Like imagine that, take that over 12 months. That's a million dollars that they were throwing away from leads that they literally just were throwing in the trash because they're like, ah, we can't do anything with it. That now they're going to monetize 81000 just next month alone. So, so how, tell me how that works. What is the process here? Well, there's so there's a number of pieces to it. One is um, you can't ever ask somebody, do you want to talk to her? If you realize that the price that they want is too high, it's close to retail. Let's say let's say it's a $350,000 house is, is where it would sell right now. If they want, let's say they want $335 for it. There's no room to wholesale or fix and flip or anything else, right? Like you're right there on the edge. There's just no money in it, right? Well, so they want to sell. Um, and, and I guarantee you, you see the you, people see these all the time. Um, but if you say, hey, do you want to talk to a realtor? Everybody's brother's uncle is a realtor, <laughs> right? They don't yeah. want to talk to a realtor. And if you send over, one of the things I've also seen is a lot of investors send leads over to realtors and say, hey, call this person. Well, what happens when you send a lead? How hard was it for you to get them on the phone, right? Like, why are you sending it over? You send over 50 leads and say, hey, call these people that all want to sell. Like of the 50, you might get in touch with five, right? Like it, mm -hmm. you just call and call and spin your wheels and spin your wheels and everything. So you got to set the appointment. You don't call them a realtor. You, you, you just get them in front of people, right? That's the whole key. If you can get people in front of people, uh, a good salesperson in front of people, that's, that's how you get it done. The other piece is you got to choose your realtor wisely, right? Because if, if you choose somebody that maybe he's a really nice fr guy, a friend, a girl that you like, whatever, but they don't have that like cutting sales edge. Like you're just throwing your leads away. And a lot of times investors think, oh, well, they're a realtor. They know their stuff, right? Because they passed the test and everything. Well, literally it doesn't mean they know anything. They mean like most realtors know nothing. Like most realtors are terrible. The real reality is 50% of all realtors in an MLS do zero deals a year. 25% of all realtors in an MLS do three deals a year. And then of the other 25%, you know, you're going to find the people that do most of the business. And even the people that are doing like 20, 30 deals a year are not really the top producers. You want people that are doing, you know, 40, 50, a hundred, you know, like something like that, like a ton of deals. So that's how you can tell the difference between the 1%, the uncommon versus the common. So I had an experience much like the one you described where I thought, she, she, well, she was a realtor. She was, is an investor, but her main business was being a realtor. And I thought she would be great. Never, never could close the deal. And I was just stymied because it should have been at the very least, it should have been something here. Here's, here's a lead, somebody that wants to sell retail. Why would you not go all out and close that deal for yourself? Heck, I wasn't even smart enough to really ask for anything. I was, she was helping me in other ways. Uh, so I was, said, here's the lead, but nothing ever, ever came of it. So how you talked about choosing the realtor. So, but how do you get those people, those top, top producers to see the value in working with you? How do you get them to have that partnership? See, this is where a lot of, uh, <laughs> this is what's so hilarious. I was, uh, I'm talking to a friend of mine. So we went over to, uh, uh, to EXP Realty the other uh, uh, last year, right? And the cool thing with EXP is you you literally become partners with everybody that joins with you, right? And so the guy that I I joined with, he also had a massive retail team, but he never worked in the investor space. And I've been introducing him because we're doing this partnership with all of the investors across the board that want to be in partnership with us and learn how to mm -hmm. do this. Um, I'm, I've been introducing him to all these all these folks, and he's just like Chris. 
He's like, these are the leads that agents salivate over. They pay so mm-hmm. much money for. They want so bad is, is seller leads. And mm-hmm. I'm meeting, he's like, I, I'm meeting all your friends, these massive wholesalers from all over the country, or like all these people that literally they get leads that agents would salivate over and they just mm-hmm. throw them in the trash. And they're like, nah, no, they want close to retail. Not worth my time. Not worth mm-hmm. my time. And he's like, Chris, I there is there is so <laughs> much here, and I can't believe people don't see it. So, how do you find the people? If you so so one, if an agent doesn't get the value of having somebody send them um, a bunch of uh, seller leads or seller appointments, then that agent is probably a turd, and they need to be flushed. Right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's that's the first one. Number two is uh, so yeah. If they don't get it, then they don't get it. They miss it, and you you shouldn't spend your time explaining to them. Wait, mm-hmm. I'm giving you a bunch of seller leads, and you don't see the value in that. Um, and so that's that's number one. And then number two, um, because in most states you have to go to school longer to cut hair than you do to get a real estate license and help people with mm-hmm. the largest transaction in their life. Um, you know, a lot of investors that I meet, they think. All of a sudden, because there's the big R next to their name, that realtors know their stuff and are good because you know they've been certified. But like realtor school is not the same as law school, right? Like you didn't go to school for four years to like you know to you know you you took a sixty right. hour class, right? So that that's it. And most most realtors don't don't do much business. So you've got to find the ones that are top producers, and even the ones that are top producers sometimes don't know how to shift, right? That old dog, new tricks. Right, right. That's why what what I teach, and this is if you are an investor and you're looking to scale your own business or looking to partner with an agent, anybody you get into business with, you're looking for these four traits, happy, hungry, humble, and smart right? If they're not happy, it's just a matter of time before they start beating you up on referral fees <laughs> and like just get angry and all the other stuff and how you're nickeling and diming and taking from them and all the other, you don't want to be in business with people that aren't happy. Hungry, like this is one of the other things, like the girl you talked about, my guess is she probably didn't follow up. She probably didn't call. Yeah. Like, like for me, I'll tell you what, like, I mean, you heard my story, right? I'm calling them yeah. every week. Like I'm going to yeah. make things happen. If the door is closed, I'm climbing through the window, right? Like you, <laughs> that kind of person, you know, so happy, hungry, humble. So this is one of the big areas where I think that people miss mistake stuff, right? Like, like, you know, just on this call, you can tell I'm, I'm a pretty confident person, right? Um, and so a lot of times people confuse arrogance with confidence. It, those are not the same thing. Um, conf- you can be confident and humble. Humility means I'm willing to go and find people that are better than me and sit at their feet. I'm listening to podcasts every day. I'm calling mentors every day. I'm having people speak into my life, like literally shift the way I think. And I'm, I'm, I've got a, a firm grasp on, th- grasp on things, but I, I'm holding it loosely and willing to shift when I see there's a better way, right? But there's a lot of these, these folks that, you know, they're not being willing to be humble. They're not willing yeah. to shift. They're like, no, this is the way you do it. It's like, you don't want to be in business with rigid people, right? Like, if they say, this is the only way to do it, then, okay, well, how's it working for you? If, if it's working, great, cool. But like the whole Dr. Phil, how's it working for you? If you're not making any money from mm-hmm. it, then shift, yeah. right? And then smart... Yeah. <laughs> Smart. The last thing is, and, and I'm sorry, I know I'm monologuing now. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm talking too no, much. Just, you're so interesting. No, you're good. Yep. Yeah, so smart. A lot of times people think that's like, you know, like SAT scores. That's, that's not what smart is. Smart is don't pay the stupid tax. The stupid tax is if you make the mistake once, don't make it a second time, right? Everybody <laughs> makes one mistake, but when you make it a, a second time, a third time, you know, or don't evaluate, like you go on a bunch of appointments and you don't get any of them, you're paying a stupid tax because I promise you, you're probably making the same mistakes and you just haven't spent the time to evaluate it. Or you're like, oh, it's not a motivated lead, but yet they sell on the MLS a week later. Mm-hmm. They were motivated, just not motivated to work with you. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, the stupid tax, I like that. So when you are an investor and you go to, when someone calls you, you, you're assuming that they want something specific. They want cash. They want a hassle-free, easy, quick closing. Yeah. When you get there and you cannot come to an agreement, then it might be the, lo- the logical thought then now is to get involved with a realtor and pass that deal over to them. So how do I, as the investor, get paid? Yeah. So, um, there, there's a, some States allow like marketing fees or whatever when right, you know, right. on, on, on the HUD. Yeah. 
you can pay marketing fees. Um, but I, some, a lot of other states don't. And so I just think it's the, easy, the easiest way to do it is to just get licensed as an agent, right? There's five mm -hmm. states that are requiring wholesalers to be licensed anyway. Just get out in front of it. You either get licensed or get somebody in your team or a spouse or somebody to get licensed. And then, then you can receive referral fees legally. Just It's just a W-9 and you just transfer the referral fee over at closing um, and, and it's done. So it has to be someone, you have to be considered a team no, no, you just have to have a license. And like, I, you know, listen, I'm, I'm licensed in, uh, oh, let me give an example. Like one of my really good friends, um, she's licensed in California, but she does virtual wholesaling in Pittsburgh. And so every single deal she gets, you know, gets paid, you know, a refer, it's just, it's considered a referral fee, but she gets paid her money. Um, even though her, her real estate license is in California. So, uh, you can be licensed in any state in the union, um, and receive referral fees. If you're virtually wholesaling, if you're doing it in a different area, like all, all of that. So if someone were wanting to follow your model, what would that look like? What would it be? It would be a percentage or a dollar amount. What does that look like? Yeah, I think if you're setting appointments for uh, for agents, I, I would say about 35% is is a good number. 35% of their six or seven percent. Uh, yeah. So let's say like okay. the average. Yeah, I think the average uh, commission in America is 10 grand. Which, by the way, just think about that. If for every one uh, wholesale deal, you were able to get three listings, if you brought it in house, if you were the agent, and so you, maybe you do one one wholesale deal and you make whatever whatever you make mm -hmm. on that, and then three listings at 10 grand, you make 30 grand for every every one wholesale deal. Tell me that doesn't change your uh, your yearly income. Right. But right. Um, but yeah, that's yeah, that's that's the deal. That's a very par powerful argument for investors getting the real estate license. That one thing right there, of course, you know, it gets you MLS access. It gets you a lot of other things that maybe you're depending on someone else for. Um, some cases, you can be an unlicensed assistant. You can do that in Kentucky. Uh, so you can have that. But there's got to be a way for it to be a win-win for everyone. And this is a scale thing. And, and I've, got, I've got that right, Chris. Hmm. Once you can scale this, then the money can start flowing in. Yes, exactly, exactly. So you talk about getting paid every time the phone rings. I love that, so making money off of every lead. So how do you keep track of all these leads? You talk about follow-up and I'm passionate about follow-up. Is it a CRM process? What's your follow-up look like? Yeah, it needs to be in the CRM. And um, and listen, I <laughs> it's one of these things, like I'll speak at a conferences and stuff and it's funny because we'll, I'll talk with the other speakers and we always talk about best practices, but then we'll also talk about like our business and, and the reality of it. And like the, the interesting thing is like, you know, my business, you know, I've got a pretty massive business right now that's firing on a lot of cylinders, but you lift up the hood and, you know, maybe there's something rusted out. Maybe it's not always working. So, <laughs> so like, if I'm going to be completely honest, this is an area that, that we're good but we're not great. And I actually hired somebody that is, um, I call her our velvet hammer, where she's looking at every single one of our leads. So before we, what we were doing is we were having a VA check every lead. And if every lead did not have a to-do and every lead did like a follow-up on it and every lead was up to date, then that agent would no longer receive leads until that was up to date. Well, um, that mm. process was imperfect. And so now I hired somebody that's like, you know, literally looking at it and we'll just pause them and say, you no longer can get leads if everything is not, is not up to date because these leads are gold, right? Like they really are They're You know, they want to sell. So they are. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so if somebody says, Hey, I, I want to sell, but I'm not going to sell for six months, then boom, you have a, a follow-up for 90 days. Cause that's one of the other keys. If somebody says six months later, then you put that in half is when, uh, when they're probably going to sell. <laughs> Do you, do you see that if you find the right agent, uh, their mindset can quickly get in place? And what about the investor too? The investor's got to have a certain mindset to be on board with this too. Hey, I'm going to give you these leads and it has to be a real trusted partnership there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One of the things that we also say is that every investor should also tell the agent that if they if they get there and they want the cash lead or the cash number that uh, they will um, uh, that if they want the cash number that that they'll pay the agent exactly what they would have gotten paid 
if they were to have listed it at the yeah. list price and they're going to give them a $500 kicker, right? Because yeah. here's the deal. We can tell the agent, hey, I'm giving you all this stuff, you know, do the right thing, do the right thing. But here's what I've found is we want the agent's interest to be in the same alignment as the investor. If everybody is in the same place, then there's no question inside where, you know, we're just like, no, nope, I'd rather kick it back because then I get a commission and I get 500 bucks and I don't have to worry about it anymore. And maybe the investor paid a little bit more money than they would, but it also keeps, it allows you to more freely give deals that you, like if you just hold on to deals that eh, maybe this will turn, maybe this won't, and you hold on to it. And then all of a sudden they sign with another investor, it's money out the door. At least this way you're able to monetize more of your deals. Yeah. I've had occasions where, um, through the direct mail, I would generally it got caught, you know, uh, through the vetting process, but where a letter would go to someone, usually a probate, and in the process, in between our due diligence and the letter getting there, it had been listed with an agent. So I would found, I found that you could have a conversation with the agent. You could be very honest and say just what you said. What if I present the cash offer and I give you what you would get? And I, I was giving them a thousand dollars more. So see, there you go. I was giving them their commission plus a thousand. Uh, would that work for you? And they said, sure. I mean, why would they say no? But you've got to be upfront about what's going on. And and it's got to be, there's got to be something in it for them that they get that's they wouldn't get. So whatever that is, if it's 500, if it's a thousand, because sometimes the reality of it, if you're doing direct mail marketing, things like that happen. You know, it's not an on purpose thing, but they, they just happen. Right, right, right. Do you ever keep any properties for yourself, like uh, creative finance, do a creative finance deal with any of those uh, subject to, or any of those? Is that something you do? Yeah. I mean, I I'm helping uh, one of the, uh, one of my business partners um, do a sub two deal right now that they brought to me. And, um, you know, I was like, you guys should just buy it. So like, like for me, <laughs> Like I, I feel like the biggest problem with uh, real estate agents and wholesalers is they don't buy their own product here. It, like, like hear me now, everybody sees themselves as real estate investors. And I don't know that that is necessarily the way that I would phrase it. Right. Because if you're, if you're really building wealth, uh, wealth is when your money works harder than you work. But every time you wholesale a property, you are trading time for dollars, right? You're, mm -hmm. you're in a transactional roller coaster. And if you want to build wealth, wealth is when you buy once and get paid for the rest of your life, right? And so mm -hmm. that is, that's how you really become wealthy, right? Otherwise, you're still trading time for dollars. And if you think you will build a business that does not occupy brain space, and like, I mean, I haven't gone to an appointment forever and I get, I get paid every month, but I'll tell you what, it occupies a lot of my brain space. It's not mm -hmm. like I just get mail, mailbox money that just comes in. It still occupies my brain space and I'm still putting time and energy and effort towards it. I don't have a portfolio that is just kicking out cat. Well, I do have that yeah. portfolio, but that's not the majority of my business right now. Right. Right. Everybody is in stages. I mean, yeah. So Talk about your program, uh, REI Revive. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, well, first of all, um, when we went over to EXP Realty, what I decided to do was anybody that decides they want to get light, a real estate license and join us, because the way EXP works is it's a virtual brokerage. And so like we were with Keller Williams and the owner of our franchise made a fortune by all the people in there. Mm -hmm. And so what eXp does is just says, hey, we're a nationwide brokerage. Anybody in the world can just partner with you. And instead of paying the owner of this brick and mortar office, we're gonna pay the people that uh, that recruit and, uh, and help the people in their world. So it, it becomes a very flat organization instead of a lot of people getting paid all the way up. And mm -hmm. it's crazy. Like my buddy who brought me in, you know, he makes $89,000 a month because he's brought in 41 people. It's crazy wow. and he helps us. He helps us all do this. So for me, I was like, you know what? I, I'm going to stop selling my program for, I was selling it for 6,500 bucks. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to give it away to anybody that wants to join us at EXP. Um, you know, you'll, you'll get all the modules, like teaching you how to build this realtor relationship. And it even trains the agents. Um, and then once a week, a group coaching session. And, you know, if you, you just hang your license with us over with me personally at EXP, and, uh, and we become business partners and I help help you build this whole uh, this whole process out. 
Awesome. That's, that's a great relationship. You talked about training agents. Yeah, exactly. How do you do that, Chris? Train an agent? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so on the modules, we, we give them access <laughs> to the modules and, uh, um, and we go through, you know, we go through the five reasons why somebody called an investor um, and we give the scripting behind how to, how to answer all of those questions. Um, we do role plays on our weekly call. We do all of the different things to help those agents close at a high rate because what I promise you is when you heard me talk about this, everybody's like, oh, this makes so much sense. But I promise you, call 10 investors and ask them if they've ever tried giving leads to realtors to monetize or capitalize yeah. on it. And I mm -hmm. bet at least nine of those investors have said, oh, we tried it. It doesn't work. And mm -hmm. of course it doesn't work because the system that, that you're using is broken. And I already explained why it was broken, but that's what we do is we, we explain the system that does work. But Again, this is where the uh, humble part has to come in. You, we've got to get agents that don't say, oh, no, I know how to sell, blah, blah, blah. But mm -hmm. we say, hey, if you have a program that works, a system that works, that's going to make everybody money, <laughs> tell me. Like, do I need to wear um, a suit? Bring it on. A suit? <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I make a ton of money, you know, tell me how high I need to jump and I'll, I'll jump that high. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Chris, that's uh, such good information. And this is going to give people a lot to think about. They're, they're going to have to think about this one. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's always fun. You're, you're so energetic. Well, Sharon, thank you so much for having me. I, I've had a great time with you. Sharon, do you mind if I just share how people can find me? If they're... Oh, no, go ahead. Okay, cool. Yeah. So my website, uh, chriscraddick.com or Instagram at cradrock. Um, or even uh, on TikTok, uh, uh, Chris Craddock official. But on Instagram, if you uh, if you go there, if you want to send me a DM, I I personally uh, work to to respond to every single uh, uh, personal DM. Maybe it's not right away, but within a week or so, I'll uh, I'll, I'll personally respond to everything. Uh, thanks for that information, uh, Chris, and uh, thanks again for coming on the show. And thanks to all the listeners for coming out today. Uh, please leave us a rating and a review and over on iTunes, and we will see you same time, same place next week. Bye for now.